Well, everyone, today is Thursday, June 25th, 2020, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. Our numbers continue to rise, so more and more people are finding the show. That's fantastic. For a while, I thought I was going to have to get a, a new GoToWebinar account. We had so many people. All right, what are we talking about? Well, current market conditions, obviously. I don't have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them to the slides just so my ADD doesn't kick in. And then when we get to the live charts, you can ask about anything you want. Your favorite stock picks, same thing goes there. Wait till we get to the charts, the live charts, and I'll let you know when that is. And you'll obviously see live charts coming up. And then ask about one stock at a time, and that's for your benefit. So what are we talking about? Well, I want to follow up a little bit on volatility. And, you know, I ended up going back down that rabbit hole. And as I've said before, it can be quite a rabbit hole. However, sometimes some good things come out of a lot of this holy grail type of research. And one thing that I've noodled with over the years is how do we find a trend day? And I call a trend day a holy grail day. And that'll make a lot more sense in just one minute. And I think I'm on to something. And before we get into all that, I want to touch on more on simple stuff to stay with the trend. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often sum it up, stealing a line from my friend Greg Morris. All predictions about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. On my website, I've done these bear market updates. If you can't sleep at night, as uh, Greg often jokes, not about my stuff, but his, it, it just don't operate heavy machinery afterwards, afterwards. But I think it'd be a good exercise to go in and look at what I said coming into this bear market. And I might change that to bull market soon, although obviously we've gotten a little choppy in here, specifically in the P's. We'll talk about that. All right, so simple ways to stick with the trend. Landry Light on the 30 EMA. I tend to glom on to something for a while and, and sort of squeeze it to death, sort of like in 1994, 95, I forget exactly when it was. And, I think it was published maybe in 1996. Back then, I was doing a lot of research with the 30-day EMA. And that's when, by accident, I discovered Landry Light. I didn't call it that back then. One of the guys that read the article said uh, he called he named it Daylight. And then it became Dave Light. And now it's Landry Light. As I've said before, my wife complains because <laughs> I don't put my name on stuff we were in italy years ago first time she met bollinger she's like oh that's the guy with the bollinger bands how come you how, come, how come you don't put your name on stuff I'm like, all right i'll start so anyway stockcharts.com has been kind enough to work with me and as you know i don't have a lot of indicators and the caveat before we start talking about any indicators whatsoever is i like to see indicators as illustrators they don't predict anything, but they tell you what has happened in the past. So Landry Light is simply lows greater than moving average, remember, and highs less than a moving average. And you could pick your favorite moving average. If you're doing longer term trend following and something like the S&P 500, then a 50 week moving average is a good average to use. And you could set both simple moving averages and exponential moving averages, which they just added a couple of days ago to this indicator on the new stock charts platform. And I think they're rolling it out next week. And keep an eye out, I'll be doing a show soon where I cover all these little indicators in a little bit more detail or illustrators as a column. But you can see coming into this whole mess, the lows were greater than the 30 day EMA. 30 day exponential moving average. And you could see we had Landry Light and in Tarzan speak, that's good. And the reason I introduced Tarzan is people want like a line in the sand and where exactly will you turn bullish and where exactly do you do this? Well, markets unfortunately don't work on exacts. And I suppose if they did, they wouldn't exist. But as a general statement, if the highs are less than a moving average in Tarzan speak, that would be bad. And then, of course, if the lows are greater than the moving average, 
In other words, you have upside Landry light, the green in the bottom histogram, you see. Then that would be good. So you can see since April, now today we might have the first downside, we'll see. But since April, we've had mostly Landry light for that entire trend. Now, other little things you can look at, like the fact that the 30 day EMA has been on a positive slope. So that's another good little simple trend following indicator. So these will be in the ACP platform soon. I also had them programmed a few years back in Metastock, which we're gonna look at a couple of things in Metastock in a few minutes. I use a lot of tools and uh, the good folks at stockcharts.com have really been accommodating to me and they're adding more and more of my stuff into their platform. And that's been useful for both me and the clients of stock chart so i'm very grateful to them for that but i think it's okay to use a few tools i'm kind of a tool fetish kind of guy if you look at my garage i got a, sh a shit ton of tools in there i think it just demonetized my video now a reoccurring question that i get and one day i need to break down and do a frequently asked questions i think if i'd have done that 30 years ago i probably wouldn't have had a cubital tunnel syndrome and uh, surgery and carpal tunnel syndrome possible surgeries in the future and another cubital tunnel syndrome so one day i need to get around to building a a, a fact page maybe i could put one of you guys on it but one of the questions i get over and over and over and over and over again does it work intraday and i was just kind of skimming through my inbox this morning and somebody said does your stuff work in other markets? And it's like, yeah, markets are markets, okay? The S&P, which we're gonna kind of beat to death here today, is actually a, a fairly efficient market or super efficient market. And it doesn't trend a whole lot. It actually chops around a lot. Now you look at these longer term trends on the chart and you think, oh, it just goes up. Well, yeah, but it occasionally goes down quite a bit. And then more often than not, it does chop around a whole lot. So my stuff does work in other markets. I think it's important to pick your spots carefully. If you're doing something like Forex, maybe look to trade on the fringes with something like bow ties, which I've done on and off in the past. I'm more excited about catching an inefficiency in the market, something like an IPO like ZI, which we are long, and I am personally long in the trading service. Something like that, that has the potential to make a big move, such as GAN, 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 we're long on that one too. UBX, not an IBO, IPO, but high historical volatility, high volatile or highly volatile stock, I should say, we're long on that one. So those stocks have the potential to make really, 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 really big moves. And somebody called me a couple of days ago, a friend of mine, and he's like, I wanna get into these slices. I wanna buy a slice of Amazon or whatever, from." Uh, I think Charles Schwab is offering these little pieces of these stocks. Well, that's great, and I get it, and I'm glad you're getting into investing, but you're much better off, as I told him, trying to flesh out a little IPO or find, I should say, some sort of inefficiency in the market. You know, if, if only you had a good friend that was doing all this research daily and would be willing to share it with you, you know? But something like UBX, could double or double or something like zi could double now amazon yeah amazon might double again but the chances of amazon going from 2500 or wherever it is to 5000 fairly quickly that that would likely take a while and if you're just buying a little slice share of it it's probably not going to do you a whole lot of good so the bottom line is i do look for inefficiencies in markets but that does not mean that I won't trade an efficient market like the E-mini or the inverse index shares or ETF shares and things like that. You just have to pick your spots more carefully and occasionally sometimes some wonderful day trading opportunities come along, which I'm gonna flesh out here in just a few minutes. So yeah, pat patterns are fractal. You could use a bow tie intraday. I know a lot of people do. You can use the Landry light intraday uh, one thing I've been experimenting with a little bit is when I make an intraday trade. I, I don't want to use the word day trade because that kind of 
suggest that I'm in and out and in and out like the mouse going for the cocaine or the rat going for the cocaine. But if I make an intraday trade, what I try to do, and try being the keyword in that sentence, is hold on as long as possible. When we get to the live charts, if you guys remind me, bring up a couple of these more volatile stocks or some of these hot stocks, and we'll take a look at some of these intraday trends using something like the 30 EMA to help keep you on the right side of the market. So yeah, it works intraday and it works in other markets. If you're in an efficient market, then pick your spots carefully. Now, here we have the trend day that we had yesterday in the S&P 500, and this is the spiders. Notice that the entire day we were below the 30 day or 30 period, I should say, EMA. This is a five minute chart. Now, you're probably thinking, well, Dave, it doesn't really make sense to have a 30 EMA for the first hour or so of trading because it's not really a true representation of where the, the market is, but it gives you a pretty good idea. And you can look, look at something like the E-minis, which trade on Globex, which are a little bit more contiguous to see where that exponential moving average is, but it does catch up pretty quickly to price. I think. I forget the exact formula, don't quiz me on this, but I think an exponential moving average is like 95% or something of the current closing price. So it does catch up fairly quickly to price. But again, you can see here we had Landry Light to the downside all day long. So it was a wonderful trend day in Tarzan speak, good. Now, good for trading an index, okay? Bad. I sound like Stevie Nicks when I said that, didn't I? Bad. <laughs> Anybody like Stevie Nicks in here? I'm going to have to kick you out of the group. <laughs> anyway, I don't want to get too far off on a tangent on that. So that was a really good day. Nice trend day lower. Nice again for my index position that I put on fairly early in the day and rolled throughout the day. Not good for my trend trades, existing trend trades. But if you fast forward to today, you can see we had a little bit of red on the downside. We had a little green on the upside, a little flat in between. Flat meaning that the price bar is intersecting the moving average. And then we had a little red, and let's see where we are now. Well, the E-minis are above the 30 now, so let's see what's happening. Yeah, it looks like they're trying to break out their range and, and, and go up a little bit, which would be fine with me since I'm mostly long. But you can see today so far has been choppy, but something as simple as Landry Light can help, again, to illustrate, not necessarily indicate, what a market is doing. And if you go in and look at yesterday's, even though we had a great trade yesterday, around one o'clock or so Eastern time, you can see that the market kind of started to begin to chop sideways, and then you actually had a tiny little bit of green Landry light late in the day. But again, you can see today's pretty choppy, and we can look at the live charts in a few minutes, and we'll see where that Landry light is. In fact, I think it would be kind of fun. I know I'm a nerd, but I think it would be kind of fun to pull up the, the live charts within the stock charts ACP, and we could see where the Landry light is stacking up, and I'll See, if you guys don't come up with any volatile stocks for me to look at, I'll, I'll see if I can find a few on my own. So today so far, kind of choppy. Maybe we'll get a little breakout, maybe we'll get a little trend, which would be nice. And, and Tarzan speak, not good. Now, when you do get these choppy days, and this is something I'm gonna flesh out in just a few seconds, but let's say you're getting a choppy day, and let's say you tried to catch a trend intraday in something like an index share or e-minis or something like that, and you got stopped out, well, what you need to tell yourself is self, maybe the market's just choppy, even though I had this great looking setup, whatever that setup is. So let me draw a line on the trading range for the day so far, and maybe not trade anymore until we get out of that range and what you also might want to do which i'm going to flesh out here in just one second for 
these possible holy grail days is look at the prior day's range, set up some alerts, alarms, or at the least some trend lines some sideways horizontal lines for those highs and lows for the prior day. And then look back to see if, if you're in a trading range, especially a tight range or a fairly tight range like we've been in lately, and maybe draw a couple of lines outside of that. And if you're getting chopped in the middle, then just say, well, I might just sit on my hands until we get out of this range a little bit. Now that's for the index trading intraday. If you were trading the trend trading stuff, then ideally you want the market to be trending nicely. But a lot of times, as we've talked about in Facebook recently, all the stars do not align. Now let's take a look at volatility real quick and then hop into the rest of this stuff. So as I've been saying lately, longer term volatility continuing to drop and shorter term volatility is rising, which might be a good thing. Now, I said this last week and then ever since last week up until yesterday, the volatility drop, 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 the short term drop that is, and then it came back quite a bit yesterday for a nice trend day lower. But to look at that on a chart, if you take a look at the shorter term volatility readings, and then the longer term volatility readings here, you can see that, as I've said quite a bit, volatility as a general statement will tend to peak out at a market bottom. Now, before you get too excited about this, it can be a bit of a, a grail hunt in that you could have a little bit of a lead or a lag time in those bottoms. When you're looking at a, a chart, as I've said quite a bit, that's kind of squished up and you got all these volatility readings, it's gonna look like a perfect bottom on high volatility a lot of times, especially when it's kind of like a spike down. But the reality is it might be a little bit offset. But you can see longer term volatility is continuing to mostly come off in here after kind of flattened out for a while. And that's because you're dropping off all those volatile bear market days and adding in, maybe I shouldn't say the word, but some of those bull market or up moves, which tend, tend and tend being the key word in that sentence, tend to be a little bit more orderly and volatility tends to come off as a general statement as a market grinds its way higher. Now, again, like I said a minute ago, short-term volatility increasing, it was increasing last week and then it decreased up until yesterday and now it's increasing again. So maybe, just maybe we're getting a little bit of a shake out or fake out to the bottom, to the downside I should say, and then the market might start heading higher. Now, if you've been following along with my little volatility quest over the past several months, as I preach, it can be a rabbit hole and I always have to be careful not to go down that rabbit hole, but then some days I wake up all excited about volatility. <laughs> Dave, what you wake up thinking about has changed. I had a dopey friend of years ago. I told the story a thousand times. When I first was dating Marcy, she had a two-year-old, and then we were playing musical chairs in my house. <laughs> and he's there, sitting in the background, drinking a beer, watching us. And he looks over at me and goes, Dave. Your parties have changed. So volatility, getting back to the reality of this, which I woke up thinking about again today, yay. Volatility can be a bit of a rabbit hole. Now, the other day, I wake up every day and I write three handwritten pages. And sometimes it, it morphs into a lot more than three pages. And I go off on some kind of tangent. But one of the things that I woke up thinking about the other day, a couple of days ago, in fact, was a holy grail day and that is defined as a day where the market starts at one end doesn't trade much above or below that end and ends at the other end on a wide range bar so let's say the market starts trading higher and never takes out its low in theory if you had a holy grail day your stop can go in right below that low but you won't need a stop because the market's just going to go up all day or right above that high for a down move and you wouldn't need to stop anyway because the market just goes down all day so on 611 we had a holy grail day and 
I define a wide range bar in this case, the HG7 would be a holy grail seven day wide range bar. So this is the widest bar of the past seven days. And it was a really nice little gap and go type of trade. And as you'll see in just one second, I, I actually screwed up on this one and it was a gift. And, and here's the thing, you know, whenever I lose money on something, I ask myself, is there a lesson here? And how much, how much did that lesson cost me? And how do I make that lesson pay for itself? So I lost a lot of money on this day, trying to play an opening gap reversal, getting a little too anxious to hop in. And in reality, not only was this a day where I should not have played the opening gap reversal, and I'll show you one little thing that in hindsight I noticed that would have kept me out, but not only should I not have played it, if I'd have done just the opposite, I probably would have made 10 times the amount of what I lost, and it could have been one of my best days of the year, at least as far as the intraday index trading is concerned. So again, you open near the top of the range or for the long side near the bottom of the range, and the market doesn't go much above that. And sometimes that open is the exact highs, we'll see in just a minute. And then the market pretty much goes in one direction for the remainder of the day. In an ideal situation, it would close at the lows of the day for a down move and close at the highs of the day for an up move. And again, ideally that happens on a wide range bar. Now, as I was writing in my morning pages a few days ago, and by the way, that comes from Julia, Julia Cameron, and I just found her book recently. I've, I'm still trying to find stuff. People come to my office, and I'm like, ah, I'm still sitting in my office. I was like, how long have you been living here? I like, oh, since, since, since September. <laughs> so it'll be a year soon. I guess I need to finish setting everything up. But the morning pages come from a book called The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. And I do have our newer book, which I forget the exact name, something about a dragon, which is Artist's Way for Business. And I've only read a few pages of the first book. And I started doing the morning pages, which you recommended. And I haven't gotten around to finishing the book. We got It got packed away for the move. Anyway, not to get too far sidetracked, but it's a great little takeaway, I think, if you start doing these morning pages, you're going to be shocked at what's going to come out of them. And some days, not a whole lot comes out of them. It's like, ah, oh, the dog farts, I'm tired. You know, dog farted, I'm tired. And, you know, a bunch of worthless gobbledygook. But on other days, I'll get some uh, pretty cool research. At least I'm a nerd. I think it's cool to me. And I'm able to flesh out a lot of thoughts and, and work to get better at my craft. So I would highly recommend that you do morning pages every morning. Get up when it's quiet, when nobody else is awake, and just write. And don't worry about what you're writing. Don't look at them for like six weeks is what she recommends. My problem now is I'm like six months behind and looking at them. And the other thing too, and I probably need to make a formal presentation on this, but you can't time travel to the future, but you could certainly time travel back to the past by looking at your pages and seeing what you were worried about, concerned about, especially as it relates to trading. And one thing that's kind of come out from, from that for me, and I know I'm off on a rant here, but my apologies, but one thing that's come out of all that for me is that, you know, I can take this trade that's a mediocre trade, or I could try to force something to happen. That will likely create future angst for me. So a week from now or two weeks from now, or even tomorrow, I'm going to write about the fact that I'm angry at myself for making that trade. So if you do that enough, and, and I really need to go through my, my pages and catch up, but if you do that enough, when you go to make that next mediocre trade, you'll find yourself saying, do I want to create future angst for me or can I just let it go? Now, again, so I realized quickly when I started writing about these Holy Grail days is that, you know, that it really is a Holy Grail day. I didn't call it that at first. I just called it a trend day. So it's pretty much impossible to know exactly when a Holy Grail day 
is going to occur. Now, instead of just giving up, I said, well, is it possible to know when they are near? And if you want answers, ask questions. And who was it? Kettering, I think, once said, a problem well-defined is a problem half-solved. So in asking the questions, I fired up Metastock and started noodling around with a few things. And I got to thinking, who's done research into volatility? I was like, okay, well, I'm going to channel Crable and Williams and Connors and Rasky and Sheldon Natenberg. Some of those names you might be familiar with. And one thing that I've noodled with quite a bit in the past is the volatility ratios, more uh, specifically the 6.5, but I also look at the 5, I'm sorry, the 6.50, but I also look at the 5.50. And if we have time, I'll flesh out why that is. So let's take a look at the volatility ratio. So, one thing that I quickly realized is that's a good start, but and we'll get to the button just one second. So you can see coming into yesterday, today is the 25th, so that would be coming into the 24th, we had the six day volatility below, or 50% below, I should say, the 100 day reading. So the theory is that volatility is due to expand and here's the 50 day down here the orange line and you could see the shorter term volatility was way below the longer term volatility and then lo and behold we had this beautiful hg seven day holy grail seven wide range bar open at the top close near the low for the day well, that should get you pretty excited. Unfortunately, though, if you're smart and have a good eye, you'll notice that it did stay below 50% for quite a while. So keep in mind that volatility can dry up for a long, long time. Now, one thing I'm thinking about as I'm showing you this, and I knew something would come out, the longer that volatility dries up, the bigger the move that comes out of it when it finally begins to expand. So we could probably use that in and of itself to help us to know when volatility is due to expand and one of these trend days is a common. Now, we don't know exactly when an HG7 is gonna occur, but in addition to the volatility ratios, I got to thinking, what else could we do? Well, inside days and two days within a wide range bar. And I'll show you that in just one second. So that's just a simple little pattern of compression and volatility. And then I think it was Natenberg or Williams, and I know Connors picked up on some of that research and maybe even Rasky too, but then you have narrow ranges, an NRB4, an NRB7, and an NRB15 is what, I got to thinking about. So I did the narrow range seven and I was like, okay, well, we've got a narrow range bar and I'll show you these on a chart, just one second, for seven days. But let's also look at the four day narrow range bar because sometimes that can let you know when volatility is due to expand. And then I said, well, let's just take it to an extreme and let's take a look at a 15 day bar. So that's three weeks worth of trading. That is the most narrow bar of the last three weeks of trading. So once you have that happen, you know that that coil or that spring is really squeezed in and that volatility is due to expand. Now in doing all this, I noticed all these things would set up and it looked like the market was poised to make a huge day and it didn't quite happen right away. But if I looked carefully, the net net price change was relatively unchanged and the market was in a fairly small range. And that's just yet another clue that the time is ticking. The clock is ticking on when we're going to get that expansion of volatility. And along those lines, if you look at the, the daily range and the average true range and notice that that's compressed, then we are due for a trend day. And by the way, 
I don't know if I've emphasized it or not, but if you could figure out when a trend day was going to occur, you would own the world, okay? And that's been my fantasy for a long time. And I've noodled with this on and off, and you can see I'm back on it again, but trying to figure out when that trend day is going to occur. And one of the things I thought about writing in my morning pages is what would happen if it hasn't happened in a while? Would it be due to happen? Would it be due to happen? Is that correct, English? Would it be due? And that'll make a heck of a lot of sense in just one second. So let's let's do a few definitions here so you know what you're seeing, and then let's take a look at it. It's so funny. I got all excited about his research earlier in the week. I'm like, I'm not showing anybody. <laughs> and then today I'm like, what do I talk about a week of charts? Like, I don't know. You got like volatility research. Like, all right. So HG7 again is the holy grail day. Now, keep in mind, my indicator is in hindsight. It's not like this little smiley face pops up on my chart. I'm like, oh, I'm going to print money today. Okay. Unfortunately, Beatrice, that's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. But I have it programmed to where the open is within 10% of the high low. Now, again, it's in hindsight. And I didn't I didn't consider the close in this situation because I wanted to see these days. I didn't want it to mask any days where I might have been able to go in and make money with a little bit of money management. If we go back in and look at yesterday's range or, or, or movement and go back, you can go back a few slides or just rewind this if you're watching it on YouTube and go back and look at that intraday thing we talked about. Notice that it was red for almost the entire day and then it kind of chopped around for the rest of the day. So even though it looked like, and this is the actual bar here, I do think that's the same bar. Even though it looked like it pretty much ended at the low, it did end up off its lows a little bit. But still, if you got in somewhere around the open and held it almost into the close, which I did, by the way, then you actually had a pretty good day based on that. Now, in HG5, I give that a thumbs up, okay? That means that it's the same as above, but it's only one week. So you come in and you got a narrow range day on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday, Tuesday, Monday, Wednesday. And then on Friday, it opens at one end of the range and it never looks back. And again, we're gonna beat the dead horse when we walk through these. Now, as I said earlier, when I was thinking about the narrow range bar stuff, what would happen if I looked at shorter term narrow range bars, just to let me know that the market might be cooking or the volatility might be compressing. So I looked at four days, seven days, and then I also put in 10 days. Now, I did not use the ATR in this calculation because ATR considers gaps. And the reason I did use it is because this is an intraday thing. We're looking for an intraday trend. So the actual range of the day is the only thing that could actually be traded because we're not holding overnight. Now, Again, after I messed around with the four day, the seven day, it's like, what about a 10 day? What about a 15 day? And I think 15 is plenty enough. So it could be a 20 or a 30 day, but we, at the least, we know it's 15. And so I'll put a little exclamation point under that one to let me know that the market is as narrowest range in 15 bars. Now, if you think about all these things, traders don't agree upon price. For long prices aren't at equilibrium and when you get that narrow range bar especially if it's the narrowest and three weeks or more you know you're due for an expansion of volatility now a wrb or a wide range bar this would be seven this would let me know that this is the widest bar out of the past seven bars and you can see in this case, it's not a holy grail because the open was in the middle of the range. Obviously, you don't know that till the end of the day, but you can see it did close on the high, but obviously this market moved back and forth during the day. Now, I thought about some little classical technical analysis patterns, such as the inside day. So that just means that the day, the low of today is less than the low of yesterday, and the high of today is less than the high of yesterday. So it's an inside day within the prior range. And then 
I also got to thinking about a a day that's not necessarily within the prior day's range, but the day after an inside day where the range is contained within the day from the bar minus three, or bar minus two, I should say. So you have kind of a wide range bar, and then you have two narrow range bars, or fairly narrow range bars within that bar. Trust me, this is all good stuff. Just bear with me. <laughs> and if not, I'll keep it for myself. Now, again, my little epiphany was, what if I just said, hey, we hadn't had a Holy Grail day in a long time. Would we be due for a Holy Grail day? So we could see going back to May, we went 50-something days without an HG7. And then also, we had a narrow range bar for four bars. You see a little four down there. And then we had a 15. So what happens the next day? Not a whole lot. What happens the following day? Not a whole lot. But that's where you can possibly draw some ranges in, okay? Maybe let the opening range establish itself and then draw some ranges in. That's a la Toby Crable again. To let you know whether or not a trend day is developing. And then, of course, a couple of days later, you had a decent trend day. Now, if you look back here, you can see it really didn't, you had a lot of 15s and it didn't necessarily pay off, but then eventually you get a nice little opening gap reversal and that worked out pretty good. So I'm just kind of looking at this as I'm showing you, but let's say you've got a 15 day narrow range bar and you come in tomorrow and the market gaps higher. Well, you might want to look for a gap and go, or you might want to look to play an opening gap reversal. And in this particular case, you probably didn't get rich, but notice that it never took out the high of the day, at least in a meaningful way, and it came all the way back in to the bottom. So here, once again, you've got a 15 day, okay? And it hasn't been that long since you've had an HG7, but it's been a little while. It's been a week or so, right, since that great day. And then lo and behold, you had a beautiful opening gap reversal. Now, again, you had a couple days where the market didn't do a whole lot and made some fairly narrow bars, but you could draw a line here and say, okay, well, this is the high of this day, and now we got the low of this day, so we're in a really tight little range here, so I'm going to wait for it to break out that range before I look to take some action. Now, this one here, nothing's perfect, right? This one here sort of came out of the blue. This was that 611 one that I lost a lot of money on and which inspired me to get off my ass and do a lot of research so that doesn't happen again. But that one's kind of out of the blue. So we really didn't have a whole lot of warning on that, at least from what I can see from this chart here. But sometimes you just, the market just gaps and just keeps on going, a gap and go situation. Now let's zoom in on yesterday's so we could see what is to be gleaned from that. So we had eight days without a Holy Grail, seven, an HG7. So that's that's really not that big of a deal. That's not that long. But we did have a narrow range bar 10 going back about a week or so. And that was after a narrow range bar four. And then we had a narrow range bar 15. So we know it's kind of cooking in here. In fact, the next day you had kind of a really cool little opening gap reversal, which coming into that day, you could say, yeah, it's an opening gap reversal. I need to go and see if I played that. I think I did. I don't know for a fact, but had I done this research a few days earlier, I could pretty much guarantee you I would have played that opening gap reversal, knowing that it's coming off of a narrow range bar of 15. But then after that day, what do we have? Well, we had an inside day and then if you take the high of that somewhat wide range bar, that outside day compared to that narrow range bar 15, and take the low and draw that forward, you could see that we almost had an ID2, okay? Meaning that the two bars were within that prior bar range. So in this case, on the 23rd and the 22nd was almost nearly contained within the 19, June 19th bar. Now, the other thing I noticed coming into yesterday was that on a net-net basis, and I started 
I hope I can keep up with this. I've done this many, many times in the past. I've done so many things that I think are wonderful. I just, I get so busy with so many other things, it's hard to keep up. But I started a little sheet where I'm writing down these volatilities and some gleamings like, hey, the net net is pretty much unchanged and the average range is pretty small. And we kind of have two bars within that big bar range and so on and so forth. So I think if I was doing this a few days ago, and again, I'll have to go and check my trades on the 19th. I can't remember whether I shorted or not on that day. I think I did, but I'll confirm it before next show. But if I had this research going in, I'd say, well, wait a minute, we've got a narrow range bar, look for an expansion in volatility and maybe let it get outside of the range. Well, an opening gap obviously pops it out the top of the range. So I think we had a lot of clues coming into yesterday's HG7. So what are the strategies? Well, opening gap reversals, that's a biggie. And ideally, if it's to brand new highs or relative new highs or relative new lows, or possibly within some sort of setup. And, you know, I'm just kind of thinking out loud here. This might be something that you guys want to look at in individual issues. Gap and go, obviously. Intraday pullbacks. Now, again, let's say you know that a narrow range, I'm sorry, a wide range bar is near, or HG day is near. But what you might want to do is just let that intraday trend begin to establish itself. Make sure you got some green happening on the Landry light on the 30 EMA, and maybe look at some shorter term ones until that 30 is has enough bars to be meaningful. Or if the overnight trading is right about where it was on the open, so you know that it's right about where it should be. And then look to maybe play some intraday pullbacks. Now, again, you want to watch the prior day's range or maybe like in more recent cases, several days range to make sure that it's intuition and not into wishing to make sure that you have a possible expansion day underway so what i'll do is i'll put some trend lines like i did earlier once the opening range is established you might hear one go off here in a little in a few minutes if they haven't already gone off before the show but i'll put some trend lines above and below the trend for the day or the highs and lows for the day i should say after the market's been open for about 30 minutes or so, and sometimes even sooner, especially if it's gap strong, gaps up or something, I'll put a alert below the intraday low. Now, if you have drawn those trend lines, and let me see if I could draw it for you here on that prior day or prior day's range. Now keep in mind, keep in mind, by the way, you know, I think if somebody knew this show is like this guy's a crazy day trader. No. The point I'm trying to make is that sometimes these little opportunities present themselves. And you could also possibly use this for individual issues or some other type of research. But let's say the market is kind of this is like a daily chart. It's not doing a whole lot. And you got narrow range bars and all. So what you might do is you might broadcast those ranges forward you also might want to broadcast the prior days or you definitely want to do that range forward so when you fire up your five minute chart so this is daily everything behind this line here this is daily and everything here is going to be intraday so you look at a five minute chart or whatever you like to look at and the market is bouncing within this little range here there's no action that needs to be taken okay now when it gets out of that little range you might begin to think about doing something. Maybe if it's closing in to, on the top of the range and you've got some kind of intraday pullback or something, you might look to play that. Or if you want to be a little bit safer, maybe wait for it to get out of that range. And the other thing, again, as I just said, watch that moving average. And if you have a nice day where the bars are kind of stacking up one on top of the other and you've got that Landry light, then maybe a trend day is developing. So maybe look to get in on some sort of pullback and anticipate that breakout of the range. You're not betting the form when you're doing something like this, okay? But it can be a way to pick up a little bit of money. I lost my ass quite a bit yesterday 
on my position trades and I picked up a little bit of money doing all this. And I think at the end of the day, I was up $19 and I might've been down a little bit by the, after all was said and done, but it was, it was not enough. It was better than a poke in the eye. Okay. And better than a big, huge loss. Now let's, any questions on all that before we shift gears here? So lately over in my trading simplified shows and and you might have noticed kind of where I'm going with this lately in my stock charts trading simplified shows I'm kind of rewinding everything almost to the beginning for the beginner because I'm seeing a lot of these Robin Hood traders make a lot of mistakes and it's like these friends and family members that are playing around with the Robin Hood I, I keep telling them if only you knew someone who has been in this industry for about 30 years to help you. And if only if he had courses and a members area and a Facebook group and all these other things. But instead they want to interject logic and all of that's got me thinking, you don't know what you don't know. And that's a that's not a good place to be. And it's amazing how humbling markets can be. And I still don't know a lot of stuff and I still find out a lot of stuff and I still learn a lot of stuff. In fact, I remember years ago, as I told the story yesterday in my trading simplified show, years ago, I was blessed to be able to work with a trader and I was helping him find stocks to pick. And we worked very closely together. I was helping to pick stocks. And I remember about six to eight weeks in, I was amazed that I noticed that he got better and better and better and how much better he was from when I met him. And I don't know how long he's been trading, but I'm guessing at least 20 years at this point. So you will be smarter in the future. Now, the reason I got in this slant, not to bum you out or anything, was because you probably all heard by now this Robin Hood trader, again, he didn't know what he didn't know, right? He ended up with a $730,000, negative $730,000 account balance because, and it's still a little sketchy, but it's my understanding that he sold some put spreads and Amazon got put to him, I think 30 contracts. And if you multiply 30 times roughly 2,500, that should get you that $750,000 round number. I guess it was seven or thirty thousand dollar loss. And what the poor gentleman didn't know was that, yeah, he owed seven hundred thirty thousand dollars, but the Amazon stock that was being put to him was probably worth seven hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. So he probably had a little bit of a loss, a loss, but not enough to take your life over. And when he saw that $730,000, he decided to jump in front of a train. So it's it's a bit of a bummer. I mean, it's, a, it's more than a bit of a bummer. But you don't know what you don't know. And that's something I've been harping on quite a bit. And you will be smarter in the future. Well, uh, Zach, it's okay. Zach said it'd be $75,000. Okay. A contract is 100 shares, so 30 times 100 times 2,500. That should get you $750,000. So again, you're going to be smarter in the future. So I would urge you to trade at a smaller size now and make your mistakes if you're newer to trading, that is. okay. I talked with someone yesterday, newer to my methodology, and he's been very methodical. He's a good trader, too. He knows what he's doing, obviously, but he's been real methodical in slowly easing into my methodology. He was trading at a half a percent, and I think maybe he's up to 1% now, and he's getting ready to move 2% and a half. But that's one thing I can guarantee is that you will be smarter in the future. So just a little admission of guilt here. Like I said, I lost money on that beautiful HG day, and I could curl up in the fetal position, or... How can I make a positive out that? Well, I can't make a positive until I make the money back, but I could certainly learn something from it. So I'm definitely smarter than I was less than two weeks ago. And the reason is because I came in here and when these spiders were breaking out, I anticipated a move that did not happen. 
So I actually bought getting all excited on an intraday chart. What do I preach? Take a look at the daily chart and put your ogre entry somewhere where it would be where it would be an obvious reversal on that daily chart so you don't get caught up in these false moves. Maybe Big Dave needs a dose of Big Dave, but you can see a day where I should have made a lot of money, this HG7 type of day, Holy Grail seven day, which I kind of beat the dead horse on, obviously, should have made me a boatload of money, but instead I ended up dropping multiple F-bombs. Now here's the irony in all this, as I said yesterday in a stock chart show, the cash S&P, which doesn't open all at once, by the way, the cash S&P never did take out its open. In fact, it was a it was a perfect textbook type of gap and go type of day. And you could see the Landry light on the 30 EMA stayed red all day. Now, again, you could argue this Landry light earlier in the day because you don't have 30 days or 30 periods of trading is not exactly right, but let's say you did have a stop well above that high, it would probably be right about right around where that moving average is. And then of course, after it catches up, you can make the argument that, well, from here on, this Landry light is all legit based on that 30 period EMA. But anyway, so that's where I screwed up. And you know what? I think I learned my lesson. You know, the problem is the market, you have to relearn a lot of lessons sometimes. So that's me. <laughs> 40 years ago, I guess. All right, a couple of random thoughts in here. Trends exist as long as people fight them. And it's taken me a while to wrap my head around it, but it does make sense. If people are shorting the market and getting squeezed out, then they have to buy in and they try to short again, then they have to buy in again. So that fighting of the trend could push the market higher. Lately, like I said last week, we had one little down day and all of a sudden it's like the world's coming unglued and everybody thinks this is it, we're all gonna die and the market's gonna go down before we die. And then the market went back up. But of course, as usual, proper money management is key. And that's a thing that I preached yesterday and it's a little too late for this poor kid but it's not too late for any other young people that might be trading. Zach, you're in here. You're a young person. You stop, wait for entries, and take partial profits when blessed. And then, of course, Trello stops higher. In other words, practice proper money management. Money management, as I preach over and over again, will cure a multitude of sins. If you're trading at a small size, then you kind of shrug your shoulders. You might drop an F-bomb. You might get pissed off but you're gonna to live to fight another day, quite literally, unfortunately, in some cases. Now, a correction is painful, but in general, healthy for the market, and a good thing. It sucks, though, when you're heavily long, I was coming, I was coming in this morning like, oh, geez, oh, geez, as we say in Florida, right? <laughs> I have a whole bunch of stocks, and I need to make sure I bang out some more additional profit targets. Now, again, as I've been saying, a lot of newly minted geniuses, and now they're starting to run into a little bit of trouble. And I'm not picking on one person in particular because I've seen it happen several times, but one person, I guess, does come to mind. Felt pretty good about being up 30% then 40%, and then now he's up 0%. And I hate to say this, but you almost need your ass handed to you before you begin to practice proper money management and before you begin to realize what you don't know. And believe me, this business is humbling. I got humbled just last week, okay? Again, <laughs> it happens often. Joe Corona is a friend of mine, and he's done a lot of volatility stuff. And Joe Corona, I don't know if he's still affiliated or not, but on and off, he's been affiliated with Tony Saliba of Market Wizards fame. And Joe used to travel the world looking for volatility. And this is, he's found himself in Australia and then he was in India for a while, but he eventually 
couldn't take living in India anymore. But uh, that's not the, the moral of the story. The moral of the story is he would hire these young Indian kids to come in and trade. And the ones that eventually did poorly were those who did well initially and all of a sudden get their ass handed to them. And Joe told me, he says, he'd much rather the new for the new guys to have their ass handed to them right away. And then in that way, they learn to expect risk. They they come to him kind of white and scared and freaked out like they could lose a job. And Joe's like, okay, well, and I'm just, I'm guessing, but Joe's really nice, gregarious guy. He's like, well, you got your ass handed to you. Congratulations, welcome to trading. Don't do that again. <laughs> All right. You know, the other thing I'm thinking about is this this poor guy, you know, I, I can't stop thinking about him. And if he'd have had someone else, and I said this yesterday too, but if he had someone else, ideally he could trust, obviously, and not make fun of him or anything and say, look, hey, uh, my account went from negative from sixteen thousand to negative seven hundred thirty thousand dollars. Is this a mistake? Am I screwed? And you know, maybe somebody could have taken a look at his spread position and did a little math and said, well, you know, you're out seven or thirty thousand dollars, but you're also going to get about seven hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars worth of Facebook. Now, I don't know how FINRA or SEC or how all that happens when you've got such a big disparate, uh, I guess, discrepancy between what you owe and everything. I don't know if they just give you the Amazon or how that works. Fortunately, I've never been in that position. But if he'd have had a forum, I'm sure somebody in the forum would have kicked in and said, look, dude, chill out. Let's see where you are. OK, you're down about 2,000 to 5,000 or whatever the case may be. You know, and I hate to say it this way, but for lack of a better word, you're going to live a phrase. You're going to live the fight another day. So trading can be a really lonely sport. And the best thing I've ever done was start this Facebook group. And you can ask my wife. She fully believes in that, too. And she's pointed that out many times. But you can interact with other traders, ask for help, and see signs and signals as they occur. So now that I'm doing this volatility research, maybe I'll start throwing out these in our 15 days and some ranges and volatility ratios and stuff like that. So the group is free. Please join. You have to be a gold member of DaveLander.com, and that's to keep the riffraff out. I'm kind of half kidding on that. I have been in a lot of forums before where there is a lot of garbage, and so far our group has been fantastic, and I hope we can keep it that way. So love you guys that are here today. You can find out more information at these URLs, DaveLander.com slash become dash a better dash Ah, forget it. You just look at the, if you look at the YouTube, it's there. Or DaveLander.com slash members if you, if you listen to the podcast. All right, let's pop into the to the live charts. Let me Give me one second to shift gears here. And then we'll start taking a look at this. If you want to start asking about individual issues, feel free to start doing that now while I get these charts set up. And then uh, I'll walk you through a couple things that's happening in the, in the markets using the live charts. Also, yeah, we've talked about the ACP. So let me make a note of that. And at the once I get to the once I get to these live charts, the markets will take a look at the ACP. All right, S&P 500. We had the wide range bar down. Notice a little narrow range we came out of. Okay, again, not to beat the dead horse, but volatility obviously has compressed in here. And if you were trying to day trade on some of these little inside days, you probably would have not made any money because the market just chopped back and forth. We had a little bit of a breakdown from that. And then today we're kind of stabilizing in here. Not a whole lot to report just yet. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ, kind of interesting in here. Broke out to all time highs. And I know candle people will probably call that a shooting star over a bird crapping on a wire or some, some kind of pattern there. But I wouldn't get that excited about a one day pattern. Yeah, we did sell off one day afterwards, but so what? We'll just have to wait and see how it shakes out. Ideally, you know me, I see the market break out and I look back for a while and then come back in or on pullbacks, but not, you know, too much. Not come all the way back into the breakout is what I'm trying to say. Take a look at the rusty, the rusty, eh, kind of all over the place today a little bit. But so far, beginning to shape up a little bit, as you can see, a little firm in here. Better than the poking eye, I suppose. Gold breaking out. 
to new highs. So, so far so good there. You can see it was stuck in this range for a while. The gold stocks really haven't followed suit just yet. But if you look at the moving averages here, you can see that they tried to roll over, they tried to bow tie down, and maybe they did for a day. But then the market got back above the exponential moving averages and the simple too. And as you know, a, an, expon an exponential moving average, easy for me to say, will turn up as soon as price closes above it. I learned that from Greg Morris. Now let's take a look at some of these areas in here. So the theme is new momentum, old momentum. So old momentum would be retail and biotech and areas like that. And so far, if you take a look at the Landry light or the bow tie proper order, which is also, by the way, an indicator in the ACP, and I'll show you that in just one second if we get a chance. You can see that the market's been headed higher, or this particular sector has been headed higher. Take a look at biotech, okay? Biotech, you had the moving averages kind of come together a little bit in here, but then turn right back up. Biotech looking excellent, okay? So far, so good there. So that's old momentum. Drugs would also be old momentum, kind of losing a little bit of steam in here, but one or two big updates would put them back to new highs, and that would certainly be a good thing. And I guess it's no big shocker with the NASDAQ doing so well. Some of these tech-related areas like semiconductors seem to be kind of hanging in there. And longer-term trend basis, the 30-day EMA, if you want to look at it that way or whatever, or the bow tie moving averages, 10 greater than 20 greater than 30. So far, uptrend remains nicely intact there. So what I've been kind of hoping for, and I know hope, hope is kind of dangerous in this business, hope in one hand and, you know, the rest. But what I was kind of hoping for is that old momentum would stay strong and then new momentum would emerge. New momentum would be something like the transports, specifically like the airlines. Let's take a look at jets. And you can see that jets, so the airlines have bottomed out in here, kind of coupling handily looking, bow tie sort of recently. And I wouldn't count down and out just yet, but one down day would put you back into the soup, so I'd forget about that. But what I was kind of hoping would happen is that this old momentum, I'm sorry, the new momentum emerging like energies and airlines and some of these areas that were left for dead, which have been rallying nicely off of lows, banks would continue higher, but lately they've been losing a little steam. And then the, the old momentum, retail and biotech, for instance, have kind of picked up a little steam once again. And that's fine with me. We don't have to trade every sector, okay? But ideally, I like to see the market fire on as many cylinders as possible. In other words, all sectors rally or most all sectors rally. So let's go and take a look at S&P going back a few days. So this is the S&P 500. And you can see today so far what's happened, okay? Going back to the open, like right around here. We just got a chop back and forth, and now we're trying to get a little bit of trend working here. But what did I say a few minutes ago? Sort of look at, or or maybe put a trend line on your prior day's range, okay? And then once the market opens, it sort of finds a range for the day, put a trend line at the bottom. And then that way you know what's happening. And just keep an eye on this 30, on this EMA. And sometimes that could be a pretty cool thing. You wanna look at NVTA intraday, that's cool. And then we'll start taking a look at your daily picks, okay? So yeah, this one has mostly green so far, but now it's a little bit of red in here. Let's take a look at, let's go back to the spiders for a second. Let me just show you something real quick. So yesterday was that good trend day, right? And then when you go back in time, you could see a little choppier. And then this was like a really choppy afternoon as you can see okay so it was green and it was red but if you have time go back in and play with all this you can see hey we're green all morning and then red all afternoon that's probably not a bad day to trade but you can see that it will help to keep you on the right side of the market and let you know whether you're in a choppy day look at this trend day here okay there's that 611 day but notice like the days coming into that, it was red, it was green, it was red, it was green, kind of a Jackie Mason kind of market. So kind of interesting there. Okay, let's take a look. So you, you kind of get the idea. So let's shift gears. Let's go back to the, the charts now that we've got a few stocks coming in. All right, V-E-R-I-T-K-O. Is it too shallow? It could be a little better, 
okay? And Zach's talking about this TKO bar here. And it did take out a few lows, but this thing ran from two to 18, what's that, 900% or something? A thousand, 1100% run. So I like to see some people shaking out. Remember the TKO, you wanna make sure some people are shaking out of the market. But yeah, that one's in my momentum list. So by all means, keep it in your momentum, momentum list and wait for a bit more of a TKO. Looking at KZR, KZR, daily and weekly bow ties rounding. Uh, no, I'm not seeing anything here, Ed. Um, well, first of all, a bow tie is made to catch a more gradual change. KZR, is that correct? That's a little too crazy because it just gapped open and it came all the way back in. Um, I would pass on that. And then you've got this big old gap back here. I know it's that I got the 10. You'd probably be a happy camper. But yeah, I'm just not seeing anything to get excited about here. It's kind of electrocardiogram. It's all over the place. And remember, a bow tie is more designed to catch something coming off a major low or major high. It's a transitional type of pattern. Mark wants to talk about SKYY. Hey, Dr. Mark, how you doing? Glad to see you. Yeah, this looks great as far as the momentum stock. I'm just not seeing any setup in here. And the other thing is I'm not as excited about stocks when they – or just like taking out the prior highs, but it does look okay. It's an ETF, cloud computing. You know, maybe there's something within that ETF that might be worth a shot. Okay, find out what uh, what was like CRWD would be one, right? I think CRWD. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Crowd, you know, maybe wait for that to pull back. That might be a better play than the ETF itself. But yeah, I hear you. If you want to get some exposure to these hot stocks. That might be the way to go. I mean, not to confuse the issue with facts, but you could argue that maybe these hot stocks, these cloud computing stocks that are doing great because of Corona, eventually that's going to run its course. Let's hope it runs, runs its course, and then they won't do as, as well. This one looks okay. It's a TKO, MHH, a little bit on the thin side, only 100,000 average shares. So... Pay attention to that. Spread might be a little wide on it. It could be a little thin. I'd like to see almost a little bit more knockout move, but it's not bad. Remember the stock earlier we talked about didn't have enough knockout? This looks like a little bit more knockout, but I'd actually like to see a little bit more knockout move, but it's not bad. Stuart, E-E-T-H for a short. I'm not seeing a whole lot of shorts to get excited about. It's not coming up on my uh, screen, Steve. Is there another symbol? Is it Canadian or something? MHH, we covered. Okay. Any more? Got a quiet bunch today. EHTH. All right, there it is. All right, he's thinking about shorting EHTH. Well, first thing I see, it's electrocardiogram, okay? Up or down? Yeah, probably down. But I would maybe look for something at high levels rolling over at this juncture. And if you remember, we, we did short a few insurance stocks, or one in particular, I think it was ACGL, back when we had the rollover. But this just looks like electrocardiogram. It's beep, 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 beep. I hear you, though. It could be in trouble. So ACGL, going back in time. We had this, it kind of looks like the market itself too, but it began to implode from all time highs. Anybody that owned it here is making money and happy, okay? And then when it begins to fall, they begin to panic a little bit. But keep in mind that people generally don't sell, sell stocks on the way up, way down, at least initially, they sell them on the way up. So when the stock tried to rally a little bit, they may or may not have sold out, but once it began to implode, then they're on the hook. And you can see that it got really ugly really fast in this one, okay? So find something that's at high levels rolling over as opposed to something that's kind of wide and loose, okay? Just bought NIU, NIU. Yeah, that looks kind of interesting. It could use a little bit more pullback. I mean, this is, eh, the volatility is not that high. It could use a little bit more pullback, but I can't really fault you for that because you've got you've got a persist. It's got everything I talk about. It's got a persistent trend, okay? 
you could draw a line through most of the bars. It's accelerated higher, and then it's done what? Pullback? I'd like a tiny bit more pullback, but it's not bad. Craig, I have to give you an almost high five on that one. And Craig is long. Oh. Yeah, okay. Uh, Stuart is long. That's Stuart. All right. Almost a high five. Craig wants to know about KO or Marina. Uh, Marina Farm. Okay. M R N A. No, that's not a knockout move because that's one. Of, now, here's the thing this would be fun to plug into my little narrow range bar program and all and see what we got cooking in here before we had a day like today. And that's, I'm just kind of thinking out loud, you know, maybe that could help you in individual issues. Now I did play this gap here. And I don't think it, I don't think it paid off. I did play it intraday and it, it might've made back a little bit of money, but in general, I think I lost money on this day, but that's how you want to play an opening gap reversal, strong, strong, crazy, strong trend, poor, poor, poor close, and then a drop on the open, that's worth a shot. Now, what did I just say about use the daily chart for entries? You know, maybe in a case like this, put the entry up here, and then you avoid a losing trade on that one. I hear you outside day down, but that's not really a knockout. A knockout would be within the trend. So technically, forget about that gap down, but that would be like a textbook knockout. And I'd, I'd be willing to bet if you go on my trading service, I wouldn't bet my life, but I'd bet 90% or probabilities of 90% that I probably had this stock on 526. Go look at the archives, davelander.com slash archives and look at 520 and I bet you a hundred bucks that I probably had it on the service in. And let's see, what day was that? That was 526. So let's take a quick look real quick. And again, I don't know. This is kind of just on the fly here. So let's take a look at that. 526. 526. I got 227s in there. All right, let's see what we got here. Oh, well, yeah, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it'd be 27th, it'd be 27th. So it'd be on the 27th. I'd be willing to bet that it's in there. I didn't mean to waste time doing this, but all right, here we go, 27. 100 bucks, 100 bucks, 100 bucks. If I don't have it in here, then I have failed. All right, M-R-N-A. Boom, there it is right there, okay? Textbook little TKO. So here, you know, here's the thing. Not that in the grand pool buy anything, but if you want to go in, if you're really bored, you can't sleep at night or whatever, then go in and look at what I picked and what I thought was the best stocks, okay? And then try to mimic those. Again, I'm not the grand pool buy anything, but try to mimic those stocks in the future. Or if you're looking at a stock and it's kind of electrocardiogram or whatever, go in and see, did Dave pick a lot of electrocardiogram stocks or does he tend to pick stocks that trade cleanly? I keep them all. All right, thank you, Craig. I keep them all BD. What does BD mean? I do a screenshot of each evening so I can go back. Oh, cool, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, I've been doing that a little bit. Oh, Big Dave, yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, I do screenshots every now and then just so I can go in and do the, the S and G testing we've been doing lately. That's in the Facebook group. Not enough time to get into that today. F by moment on D, K, and G was the initial setup subpar. Well, eh. I mean, you had a little pullback here, but it had such an incredible run. I, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more pullback. I mean, that MRNA we just talked about, now it didn't work, but that would have been a good looking setup with a nice, nice knockout or pullback, whatever you will call it. Whereas this didn't, this didn't quite pull back enough for me to get excited about. Okay. So yeah. And, and you're, you're getting smarter, Zach, because you want to, you're basically saying that, Hey, did I screw up to begin with? And you're doing a little bit of that post-mortem type of thinking, but yeah, the getting back to like the Landry list, I would encourage you to keep the old ones. You know, not you know, I hate to be the fish that got away, but every now and then something will take off on the Landry list, like TBIO. We had this one on forever, 
And of course, as soon as we take it off, it shoots up about 50%. But yeah, I keep all these old Landry lists and I keep a momentum list, which has grown to, I probably need to clean it up. I don't know, I published this recently for you guys right here. This is my latest momentum list. They've got some emerging trends in here and some really strong trends. And I probably need to whittle it down, but this list was much smaller for a while, but these are all the old Landry list and stocks that might make it to the Landry list after going through a couple thousand stocks every night. So I'll go through a couple thousand stocks and then I go through these roughly 400 stocks. Thanks for another informative webinar, Dave. All right, well, thank you, Steve, I appreciate it. FMCI is a long. Yeah, it's a little bit on the crazy side. I didn't see this one last night. I looked them up <laughs> on Yahoo to see what they do. And they're like, this company does nothing, but it plans on buying some companies. It's probably buying um, a gambling company that does online meetings and is working on a coronavirus or something, all, all three to buy, combine. It's a little, it's a little crazy. And and it did catch my eye last night. I don't know if I ended up putting it on the Landry list or taking it off after I put it on, but it's real crazy. So just know the beast you're dealing with. HV doesn't look that bad though, relatively speaking. It's okay, but be careful with that. Okay, Mike. C S I N. C S I N. I th I'm trying to think what you're trying to C S L N. C L S N. That's what you're thinking. Yeah, it looks pretty good. HV 150, wild and crazy. Super extended from what? One to six over a quick period of time. But I hear you. It, it's uh, it's kind of interesting in here. Just don't bet the form on that one. I'd actually like to see a little bit more knockout move. I mean, this is almost too crazy for me. But I hear you. Does this portfolio look pretty good? GAN, well, I'm long GAN, so it looks fantastic so far. Okay, GAN, RC. RC looks okay. It's a REIT. I'm not nuts about REITs, but yeah, it's coming off the off the bottom. So, so far, you've got a little bow tie here, a little cup and hand, a little trigger on that. All okay, right, so far, you're two for two, Zach. Let's take a look at UBX. Well, I'm long UBX, so you know I love that one. So yeah, that looks pretty damn good, I would say. And what else you got? Alt, a alt. Um, this was a little bit. This is a little bit more on the crazy side. But I hear you. It it kind of took off, pulled back. So I'll give you a pass on that one. DKNG, DraftKings. Yeah, I'm gonna. This one's in an uptrend, but I would let it knock out some more or. I'd have to, it's kind of getting funky because it almost made its new highs and then pulled back. It's kind of a weird looking pullback. So I don't know about that. Well, you stopped out of it. Okay, we out of it. Yeah, the rest of the portfolio looks pretty good, Zach. All right, any more? Nearly out of time, but I got I could squeeze in one or two more. I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of business because we'll be here. Anything unanswered, you know the routine. Ask in Facebook, and I will try to get to you as soon as possible possible. If we don't talk to you now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend and I will see you again hopefully next week. Thank you so much.